All right, all right, all right. Let us talk about framework for starting an individual donor program. So a uh, quick introduction from myself. Like you, I was once upon a time running a small nonprofit in New York City. Uh, when I first started, I was a 26 year old ED. I literally did two Google searches on my first day of work. Number one was, what does an ED do? Number two was, how do you fundraise? So I was super clueless. Uh, and over the 12 and a half years, I ran my nonprofit uh, Breakthrough New York. We went from a 250 a, 250K a year organization to 3 million, just under 3 million in private funds. So I've dedicated this next portion of my career to teaching people how to do that because I was like, I'm a smart person. Why did it take me 12 and a half years to figure this out? So I'm trying to save you all time. So it doesn't take you 12 and a half years to get to $3 million. All right, let us jump into this. So <clears throat> a couple of things that I want to talk about before starting a major gift program is you're going to need, we're going to talk about some of the pre-work you need to do. We're going to talk about how to think about a major gift program. And then we're going to deep dive into each aspect of the framework. Sound good? Okay, question one, why major donors? And what, what do I mean when I say major donors? Major donors can be whatever major it is for you, you and your organization, right? Major, if you're at the Met Opera is different than major if you're running a small grassroots organization. The important thing is pick a number. And usually when I say pick a number, it, it's gonna be like the top 10% of givers. So whatever that is for you, that could be $500, it could be a thousand, it could be 10,000, but like just pick a number because whatever number you pick is what we're gonna work towards. So when we look at, at the whole pie of people who give money, what we notice here is that 69% of giving is by individuals, right? 19% foundations, 9% by bequest, which basically means people who die and leave uh, money in their will, and then 4% by corporations. So I find that interesting because often we spend a lot of our time trying to be in this area, the foundation corporate area, but really we need to be thinking about the individual. And that is about relationships. So to Rasan's point, when we think about who is our pipeline for a major giver, we look at people who have given over multiple years, maybe two to three years. And so whatever 10X of that gift was, is probably going to be considered a major gift for that person. The reason we focus on individuals is it tends to be the most unrestricted money. And so when you have unrestricted money, that means you get to put the money wherever you need it to go. You're not restricted by uh, guidelines like, oh, well, you can only spend 5% on admin or whatever that is. But Folks find it to be the most intimidating because it is the most personal. It is the most intimate. And a lot of times when I'm training new fundraisers, it's a lot of fear around people who have money, what they did to get the money. They must be bad people because they have money. They must be thinking some kind of thing about me because I don't have money. We get into a lot of emotional stuff. So let's talk about some basic rules as far as major donor fundraising. You gotta keep it simple. And when I say keep it simple, your tracking mechanisms have to be simple because if they're not simple, they don't scale. It's just a math problem. And the math problem is this, asks minus no's equals yeses. The more asks you put out there, the more no's you're gonna get, but the more yeses you're gonna get. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out if someone will give. The best way to find out is just to ask. <laughs> so. A lot of times people will be like, well, if I just like craft like the perfect deck or the perfect ask or the perfect thing, it will all be fine and I will never be rejected. Bad news. There's no such thing as the perfect ask that will get you 0% rejection. Rejection is just part of the game. Now, the thing is, it's not personal. And if you reframe the win as the ask, as opposed to the gift, it becomes, a, it becomes less emotionally harrowing. And the key to building relationships is to listen well and ask good questions. So when you're in an ask, particularly with individuals, I want you to remember this ratio, 75% them talking, 25% you talking. And so the mistake everybody makes is like, I'm gonna give a pitch, right? Let me just tell you something. I have raised millions of dollars and there is no magical combination of words that I have ever found that unlocks generosity. What it is, is about a relationship that you build with your donor. Well, we're gonna get deeper into this. And I see the chat. Dr. Harris, can you just, um, okay, oh, you're just taking notes from me, I love it. Okay, before you get started in major gift fundraising, you, you need to get your head right. We'll talk about that. 
Uh, and what getting your head right is really about examining your own baggage with money and your own trauma with money. So we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, we talked about a major gift, setting a monetary goal. <coughs> we're going to talk about potential cultivation and stewardship activities. We also have to see who's on board and what they're willing and able to do. And when I say who's on board, I'm, I want you to think about all of the different, what I would consider nodes in your network, right? Your board, your staff members, your funders, your advisors. Now, let me talk about, let me talk about donations for a second. So donations, are, uh, trust equals donations, right? Think about the way that you make gifts. When you, we buy something or when we donate, it's usually because there's one of three kinds of trust. And if you have all three trusts, the likelihood of a gift is much higher. So there are three kinds of trust. Number one is competency trust. So do you do the thing you say you're going to do and are you good at it? Number two is community trust. Does somebody that I trust, trust you? And that is the most powerful trust. And then number three is caring trust. Do you care about me as a person, right? And so if you can get all three trusts, that's when you get donations. Now, if you can only get one of the two of them, I would say the most important is probably the second one. Like think about your own life. Hands up if any of you ever like bought something or watched something or did something because someone that you trusted told you to. Yeah, same Z's, right? It, we, are, we are social animals. We want to uh, do the things that our friends do. So when, I, when you think about the nodes in your network, think about those who are, I hate the word, but influencers who would be willing to basically lend you their, uh, their halo effect. Okay, let's talk about your fundraising mindset. So 80% of your fundraising success is your mindset. So I can be out here all day giving you tax, tactics and tips and tools and tricks and strategies and whatever. Bottom line, if your head's not right, doesn't matter. None of it matters. So let's talk about this. Brain management. Your brain is the most effective tool that you have in your toolkit. And when you have actually learned how to control your emotions around money and the ask and nervousness is when you are in control. That's when you get to run the world. So here's the truth out here, and especially in nonprofits and especially in grassroots nonprofits, there is a myth that there's not enough money out there to fund your work. We live in the richest time in human history in the richest city in the world, New York City, right? They are literally printing out money every second of the day. So the problem is not, is there enough out there? The problem is a distribution issue. So the first thing is, there's more than enough out there. You just need to find it. So let's talk about why people give money. So back in the day, the, and actually I do a much longer thing about money mindset. We're not gonna do that here because that would take up our whole time together, but this is just a very high level. Um, what I want to just emphasize for you is to take a little bit of time to think about the stories that you tell yourself about money. So it's usually the stuff you hear in your family. It's the stuff that you say to yourself. You know, in my family, I always heard, well, money doesn't grow on trees. And who do you think we are, the Rockefellers? And we can't afford that. Or, oh, that's not for us, that's for rich people, right? I'm sure this may or may not sound familiar to you. Take a moment and just like, download all of the things that you have heard growing up or that you've seen growing up or anything that creates a strong emotion growing up. Um, like when I was a kid, whenever I saw my parents fight it was usually about money. And so I had a negative feeling about money. We all have a story about money. In my family, the story was because my uh, grandparents were immigrants from China that money was stability. And so when I asked people for money as an ED, I was psychologically putting the story of, I'm asking people to give up their stability. And of course I never liked fundraising, right? But then I realized that was just a story that I told myself that my family told me. So not gonna go too deep into this, but just do take a moment to really unspool for yourself. What are the stories about money in your family and how might that affect your relationship to fundraising? I mean, literally we could, spend all of our time. We're not, 
it's gonna be yeah, Becca, just go really quickly yeah. into this because i think this i want to double click into this and have folks reflect because citizens committee makes grants to community leaders um in many cases in places that are low income need access to opportunity <laughs> a lot of people of color women immigrants who've been overlooked historically so what you said about the relationship of money and being intentional about how we can provide capacity for the people who are in our network that apply for our grants and also our grantee partners. I think it's critically important to understand our relationship of money. And so anyone who's watching this broadcast later, like um, definitely spend the time on that. And I think that's a whole other session that we could that have. That is a whole, I mean, yeah, we could spend hours on this, but the, uh, the important thing that I want to underscore for everybody watching, double click on, is this idea of charity being begging for money. It drives me crazy because at the end of the day, you as a nonprofit are providing value and your donors also have value. And it's combining those two, those two resources that you both create something bigger than you could accomplish on your own, right? So I think where we, where we make the mistake is believing that we don't have value to bring to the table. The value is whatever work you're doing. Your donor can't achieve that work without you. You can't achieve the work without their resources, right? So it's resource combining. And so when you come from a place of, we're just combining things together, it becomes much uh, more empowering. It becomes, it comes from a place of, of strength, not weakness. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving, but Dr. Harris, we're probably gonna have to do another session about money mindset. All right, let's talk about the seven phases of philanthropy. So back in the day in the 90s, they did a white paper about why people give money. Um, and they basically uh, had these seven, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold. These seven different reasons generally why people give money. Anybody here married or in a serious relationship? Natasha? All right. Natasha, let me ask you this. Um, yeah. When you first started dating your partner, did you did you bring a resume to the first date? No. Why not? Because I was just trying to get to know him. Like, who are you as a person? Okay. So okay. Resume. Now, now let me ask you this. Um, how long after you all started dating did, did you decide to get married? All right, all right. So the truth is from day one, but I didn't tell him that. So just to put it out there. Okay. Um, he, I, I did interview him, quote unquote. So I see the ring here and I, I'm chuckling because I asked a series of questions uh -huh. to make sure that he filled out. I, I completed the application. He answered the questions. He didn't know he's filling out an app. And we yeah, went yeah. to this list of things to figure out, all right, are we on the right track? Is, is it you? Because I know it's you, but can you communicate that I understand that it's Okay, you? okay. Sorry. Now, now, I mean, I know you said that you knew right away, but why didn't you all get married like the day after you met? For me, it was okay. I got, <laughs> All right. Well, in theory, for to him, know why didn't you get married? I got to get to know you. Who are you? I know you are the one, but who are you as a person? Okay. Where do we relate? Okay. And so after you got married, um, does your husband just take you out once a year for your anniversary or does he actually continue to do things to show that he's investing in the relationship? Continually investing. Okay. So I say that all. It's like very kind of silly thing. So this is the steps of the donor relationship. Identification, literally, like, who are you? Cultivation is the dating phase, as Natasha says. Solicitation and stewardship. All right, let's play a game. Of the percentage of time, how much percentage of time in this whole cycle do you think that we take for identification? Just shout it out. There are like very few of us here. 40, 50%, my guess. 40, 50, okay. Clarabelle, Heather, you have a guess? 40, 30. 40, 30. I, I was gonna say probably 50%. 50, interesting. It's 10%. How much, time do, how much time do we spend on cultivation, do you think? The dating phase, if you will. Oh, like that's 2%, then it was 10%. <laughs> uh, cultivation, yeah, we would say like 5% then. 5%, Natasha? I'm now rethinking my thoughts, but let's, I'm going to stay, keep it at 10. 10? Heather? I, I, I'm rethinking as well now that we've shown that identification is what it is. 
Um, probably 10 or 15. 35 percent mm. you need to be going on those dates and building that relationship okay how much is solicitation that's also a big one uh, yeah why yeah how much do you think 30 percent 30 you would say 70 percent okay oops Two percent, y'all. Two percent. So this thing that you all are so stressed out about, the solicitation, is two percent. Because let's talk about Natasha's example. She did her homework, right? By the time they got to the proposal, I'm gonna guess it felt very natural. It felt like the natural next step, right? But then that also means y'all need to be spending fifty-three percent and continuing to build the relationship. And around and around it goes. So as a sector, we are terrible at this part. We we do hit it and quit it fundraising. And that is why we have terrible retention rates. But if we held on, if the only thing that we did as fundraisers was just held on to the people who, who gave a gift, we would be so far ahead, right? But because we're really bad at continuing to take our wives out to, uh, to nice dinners and bring her flowers, we constantly have to keep fishing for new people. Does that make sense? All right, let's keep going. Your job is not to close a deal, it's to open a relationship. If I can do nothing else here today, it's to get you out of this transactional mindset. We don't talk to donors as if they're numbers, we talk to them like they're people. We realize that we are cultivating a relationship. All right, let's talk about donor pipelines for a hot second. So here's the deal, y'all. Anyone here ever said we're the best kept secret in New York? Anyone? Yeah? Okay. Everyone, everyone says I'm the best kept. Everyone says they're the best kept secret. The truth of the matter is that everyone feels that way. But even if that were true, the fact is there is a there is a donor funnel, right? A funnel gets it's wide at the top and narrow at the bottom. At the top of the funnel is awareness. Literally, who are you? Like people need to know you exist in the world. The mistake that many fundraisers make is thinking that oh, well, all we need to do is tell people about us and then straight away, it'll be, the, they'll give us money, right? That's the same thing as saying, well, people just need to know I'm single and if they do, they'll just marry me. Does that make any kind of sense? No, it does not. Well, maybe in Natasha's case, but in general, that probably does not make sense, right? Because you need to build a relationship. So here are the key steps in building a relationship. Awareness. Do they even know you exist? So this is where, we bring in things like uh, building your brand, like building the awareness of what you do, right? So that means appearing on podcasts, for example, it means guest blogging, it means uh, optimizing your website and SEO because people come to your website, right? It means posting on social media. So all that social media stuff that you all do is actually intended to attract people to want to engage with you further. It's very rare that you'll get a social media hit and then and then a donation, right? That's the same as like awareness and then commitment. Um, that's where you wanna use your PR, like op-eds, TV, radio interviews, et cetera. That's why you wanna be on speaking engagements and panels like this, for example. And this is where you wanna get introductions to board members who are existing evangelists. That's, wh that's where the nodes come in. So your board members and your staff members and people who are advisors to you are essentially like ambassadors that are out there in the world, kind of like recruiters to bring fresh people into the funnel. Any questions so far? Okay. But just because they now know that you're in the world, you actually now need to interest them, right? Like how many of you all have heard about a nonprofit without any other, any other engagement and donated straight away? Doesn't happen, right? You need to have something more. You need to show interest. So what happens after the awareness phase? Okay, I might've heard about you. Well, maybe then I go to subscribe to your newsletter. Maybe I actually visit your website. Maybe I follow you on social media, right? These are pretty low lift things I can do to show interest. But that doesn't mean they're engaged. And so a lot of times we have what we call, what I call vanity metrics. You're like, oh, I had this many likes on Facebook or this many followers on social. Yeah, that's great. Does that actually mean that they're doing anything? Does it actually mean they're engaged with you? 
And so engaged is where we really get people to take some kind of action. So what does an action look like? It looks like spending time on your website. By the way, I, I said eight seconds, it's actually more like three seconds. The average owner will spend three seconds on your website. So one thing I suggest that you do, have someone who doesn't know anything about what you do, look at your website and in three seconds, tell you A, what you do and B, what you want them to do on the website. It will be very informative for you. So I know a lot of you spend a lot of time making your website real cute. I think that's fine, but is it communicating what you need to communicate in three seconds? Uh, People will show engagement by opening your newsletters and emails. They may engage with social medias with likes, shares, and comments, right? So a like is probably, like a comment is probably more engaged than a like. Share is the best because share is that uh, community trust. They attend events. They go on a site visit. They agree to a meeting. They respond to a text. So this is the point at which you should be thinking about your donor. Like, what value am I providing for them? Because often in the nonprofit sector, we just talk about ourselves. So if we just talk about ourselves all the time, that's like going on a date with someone who's like, me, 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 and enough about me. What do you think about me? Are you going to get a second date? Probably not, right? So as you're thinking about donor engagement, think about what value am I offering to my donor? What is making my donor feel good about being engaged with our organization? Ultimately, what you want to be doing is building your list. Quick show of hands here. Who all has an email list here? How big is your list? No shame. No shame. <laughs> um, Size does matter. <laughs> A thousand people, right? Okay. Heather, Natasha, well, do you want? Ours is about five thousand. Five thousand. That's nice, Natasha. No, now I just heard these numbers tiny. Like, don't even acknowledge me in this question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wait. But here's the more important question: What is the open rate of your newsletters? It depends on what it is. Right. That's okay. True. Give me a ballpark. Um, between eighteen and forty-four percent. Wow. What's the what's the delta on that? What what's forty four percent? What's eighteen? Um, the forty four percent is when we have new workshops announced. Okay. And people are interested in what's new. Okay. Um, and then the lower end is when we have very specific workshops or fundraising. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, Clarabel, Natasha. I'm under 10% and um, mine is really just general talking about the mission, talking about the vision because it's still in its infancy stages. So okay. 10% open rate and all of it is still general messaging. Okay. Clarabel? Uh, we, we're not very sure, but we think it's when it's the same when we're asked, when, when we're sharing about news, it's higher than when it's or asked. Okay, so here's the thing that I, I want you to think about as you're building your list is you want to have pebbles and you want to have rocks. So what does that mean? So pebbles are things that you throw out that are things like news, updates, donor stories, um, events, etc. Rocks or asks. So when you think about communications, you can't be throwing out just pebbles and you can't be throwing out just rocks, right? Rocks, you should be throwing out maybe once or twice a year, but you have to throw out pebbles in it as a lead up to the rocks. Otherwise it's too big of a spot. They're like, don't know what to do with it. They're like, what, what is that? But you also can't just throw out pebbles because then what's the point? You've warmed up this list and what's the ask, right? So what I want you to think about too is when you're sending out communication, is it, is it nonprofit centric? Is it, is it all about you? What stories can we tell about our community? What stories can we tell about our donors? What stories can we showcase that really tell the impact of the work that we do? Because ultimately, as a nonprofit, we are not the heroes of the story. Our, the people we serve are the heroes. Our donors are the heroes. We are merely the guide. Any, any like Harry Potter fans or Star Wars fans here? Star Wars? Okay. So, you know, Luke Skywalker is the hero of the story. We are the Yodas. We're not the Luke Skywalkers. Like we are merely the guide to help our heroes achieve their greatness. And so the more that we can position ourselves in our fundraising and our communications as like, 
the, the platform through which we elevate heroes, the more likely people will be to open up the newsletters. Does that make sense? Okay, let's talk about your board members. We already spoke about it. Basically, they are also going to be your, your people. So presumably your board members are your number one fans, otherwise they wouldn't be on your board. But you also want your board members to share about you, right? They are your key to other audiences. Now, the other piece though is too, that you wanna make sure you're adding value to their people and that you're taking care of their people well. How many of you all have had board members who are like, I asked them to introduce me to people and they didn't introduce me to anyone? Anyone, anyone, Bueller? Okay, if you didn't have this problem, then like you're my hero. Um, the reason why is that they don't know that you are going to take care of their people. And it's and it makes a lot of sense, right? They are trading on their own relationships. And the last thing they want to do is be like, well, I introduced them to this organization. And then the organization did not create a relationship, didn't provide value, hit them up for money. And now it makes it awkward for me at the next Christmas party. So what, <laughs> what you need to think about is what is this donor journey that you're bringing people on that actually creates an actual relationship and actual value? And the thing is, as a donor, at any point in the funnel, you can let yourself off, right? Like we're not strong arming anyone. It's, it's an invitation, not an expectation. So finally, people get committed and they donate to your organization. So what does that look like? Money, certainly opening up their networks, giving up their time and energy, they show up for events. And remember our little circle, the more you can continue to build that relationship and make them feel appreciated, the more they'll keep showing up for you. All of the marketing that, you should, that you're putting out there is intended to increase trust. Because remember, trust equals donations. All right, let me pause there. I just threw a lot of information at you all. Uh, questions, comments, concerns before we move on. I'm going to unlock some LinkedIn magic for you. I have to check my time here. Okay, I got 20 minutes. Any questions, comments, concerns? No questions. I'm just soaking it all up. All right. Uh, do me a favor. Put one takeaway in the chat so I know you're with me. I was going to say, well, while you're waiting for folks to do that, I mean, I hope that the participants and those who watch this later understand this level of excellence that you're getting. Um, demystifying fundraising, focusing on them, not you, um, really building community. Um, all of those things are just so vitally important to being able to raise funds. Um, and so Rhea, this has just been excellent. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Dr. Harris. All right, how many of you all are active on LinkedIn? Like, are you posting at least once a week? Uh, okay. All right. Here's what I'm going to say. If you focus on no other platform, you need to focus on LinkedIn. And I know it feels very like, oh, but then the Facebooks and the TikToks and the Instagram, blah, 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 blah. LinkedIn is like the most <laughs> underutilized platform out there. Um, and let me tell you why. So a couple of ways to use LinkedIn to prospect, because I know everyone's out here being like, well, I don't have a pool. Like I don't have anyone at top of funnel, right? Like I don't know anybody. Ha ha. I'm going to help you with this. So LinkedIn <coughs> has a thing where you click, uh, you click my connections and you click all filters, right? When you click all filters, this little pop-up comes up. What you can do with this pop-up is add a connection. So let's say I want to add a board member. So in this case, I added a board member. So by the way, this is the anecdote for when your board members are like, I don't know anybody. This is what you do. You put your the connections. So let's say, you know, Heather's my board member. I put in Heather's name here. Then I click first and second degree, right? I may click New York City metro area. I may click Goldman Sachs. I don't know. I'm making stuff up here. Here's what happens. LinkedIn gives you the 12 results of someone who's first or second degree connected to your board member who fits this profile of working at Goldman Sachs it's in New York. So then you get to go to your board member and say, hey, I have this list of 12 people. Can we talk about these 12 people? And that's so much better than introduce me. Who do you know? Never effective. 
Here's the other thing too. LinkedIn also has this handy dandy filter where you can search on people who are looking for nonprofit boards or looking to uh, give pro bono volunteer hours. So what I, the thing that I want to emphasize, if you do nothing else, make sure you get on LinkedIn and you connect with all of your board members and all of your advisors, because that will automatically increase your network. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, let's talk about the romance phase. Yes, yes Clarabel. Just thank you for that tip. Okay, cool. So let's say you got the gift, everything is good. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is like the engagement piece, right? So let's go back to the engagement. Like, okay, I found out who they are. They're, you know, they're clicking on my stuff. They're liking my stuff. Maybe I, maybe I, it's time for me to start a conversation, right? So what I want you to think about is number one, reach out to your first top 20. So I have, like to have a list of top 20 prospects because it actually makes it doable, right? The top 20 should be hot though. So every single week, I want you to be looking at your top 20 and, and making some kind of action towards deepening the relationship. We call it the ladder of engagement, right? So maybe the first thing is like, we're just gonna meet for coffee. Maybe the second thing is, okay, maybe this we're gonna go on a site visit. Maybe the third thing is, okay, now we're gonna meet them and, and prep for an ask. So I want you to always be thinking about like, how am I continuing to deepen the relationship in the cultivation phase, the dating phase, in order for us to get to the point where we can be at an ask. Now, I, I'm, gonna, I'm dropping some serious knowledge here. Crafting the perfect email. When you ask people for meetings or when you ask people for anything, chances are that your emails are too damn long. You give me like a whole paragraph about blah, 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 blah. Hope you're doing well, yada, yada, yada. By the time you get to the ask, I have no idea what you want. So really simple thing. Two sentences, one question. Sentence one is a me sentence. Hey, Natasha, I'm reaching out to you because I'm representing this organization that does X, Y, and Z. I'm super passionate about it. Second question, second sentence is a you sentence. I know that you, and this has to be authentic and genuine and real, I'm reaching out to you because the last time we spoke, you mentioned that you were really passionate about women and children as well. Like you have to show you know something about me. It's just good dating, right? When you're on a date, I'm not gonna take you out on a boat if I know you hate water, right? You have to show me that I know something about you. Then the question, I have no idea if this is of interest to you, comma, but would you be interested in whatever it is? Would you, would you be interested in a 15 minute meeting? Would you be interested in a site visit? Would you be interested in uh, coming to a dinner? Whatever it may be. So a couple of different things. The, I have no idea if this is of interest to you is an out. It gives people an elegant way to save face if they're like, no, I'm not that interested, right? Also, you generally don't know if this is of interest to them. But if it is of interest to them, you've already set up the conversation because sometimes when we like hide the ball and we're not forthright about why we're meeting, do you ever have that thing where you're like, oh, I'm like going to coffee with a friend and then like halfway into it, they spring into this other thing. And you're like, dude, I thought we were just hanging out, but you had an agenda. It feels terrible, right? But if you set it up on the front end, they already know what the conversation is going to be, Okay. 75% 70, of them talking and 25% you talking. It is very rare, though it has happened, it is very rare that you are going to make an ask in the very first meeting. Because again, that would be the same as asking someone to marry you after the first date. It just ain't going to happen. But you want to think about opportunities to get them more engaged if they think that they're, if there's an interest there, right? That could look like site visits. It could look like being meeting with board members. It could look like volunteering, et cetera. Again, let them be the heroes of their own story. Now, when it is time to pop the question, when it is time to get to that 2% of solicitation, here are a couple of key things. Number one, we generally wait too long to ask. So the mistake that I have made and other fundraisers have made is um, I've gotten into the friend zone with people. And now I'm like, well, now we're like friends. And she thinks that like, I just like hanging out with her. And that now I can't ask, right? So generally we wait too long to ask. Also though, they know why you're there. They know why they're there, you know why you're there. I, 
also want to make sure that you practice the ask. So again, you do a two sentences, one question ask. So that looks like, you know, Natasha, as you know, I started this organization for women and children because this, you know, whatever personal thing, whatever. I also know that this is important to you because X, Y, Z. Here's, here's the question. Would you be willing, and there are three components to the question, the amount, the date, and what it's going to do. Would you be willing to make a $10,000 gift by October 31st in support of our women and children initiative? And then you stop talking. You stop talking. A lot of times, fundraisers, especially when they're nervous, step all over the ask. First of all, they don't actually ask. Would you be willing to support this? Uh, yeah, well, what does that mean? Or, oh, the $10,000 ask, but you know, I know that's a lot of money. So like, never mind. I, we can just forget about it. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. The key here is that you should also brainstorm prior to the ask all of the 15 different things that they might say and what you might say in response. Generally speaking, the three things that they might say falls in the category of why me, why now, what's it going to do? You have to have answers for these things. But because you've prepared your answers, you feel more confident in the ask, which is not to say that they may not ask like the 16th thing that you didn't think of, but it's about bringing a level of energy and enthusiasm to the ask, right? Like if someone asks me out on a date, if they come with, I, I like to call it BDE, big donor energy, and they're confident and they make it seem fun, I'm probably gonna say yes, much more likely I'll say yes. And if someone is like nervous, I'm like, well, I don't know if you want to go on the date. Right? You, you have to like bring the confidence. You got to bring uh, a certain energy. I, I also like to call it late night FM DJ voice. Sometimes when you're nervous, you talk too fast. So you got to just slow it down. Like we're just hanging out. We're just, if this is just easy. Would you be willing, Claravel, to consider a $10,000 gift by October 31st to support our kids? You see how the tone of your voice and the cadence and the timbre just, it just takes it down. It just makes it real calm. <clears throat> so let's say that you get the yes. That is great. Continuing to build a relationship. A couple key things here is ask your donor how they would like to be recognized and communicated with. So, so often we assume, and you know what happens when you assume, right? Some people want a lot of communication. Some people are like, just email me once a year. Some people like coming to site visits. Other people do not, right? You won't know unless they tell you. Also, make a note to that there should be at least seven significant touch points before you even think about asking for a gift again. And that touch point could look like an email, it could look like a phone call, it could look like coffee, it could look like a site visit. Like, but like you need to make sure that there's some kind of significant uh, relationship building that happens. Otherwise it, it becomes like, you know, those teenagers who just come around whenever they need money. Don't be that teenager. Those teenagers are awful. So I know that you might be saying, like, Rhea, this sounds super complicated. Um, there are two spreadsheets, and I'm happy to send them out afterwards that you need to know. These are KPIs, key performance indicators. So what you measure is what you manage. Just set yourself some goals here, because oftentimes fundraising is not the thing that is on fire. And I totally get it, having been in a small nonprofit. Like if I'm the only one doing fundraising and like, you know, the bus with the kids on it is late, like I'm going to do what is urgent, but often fundraising is important, but not urgent. So keeping yourself accountable by having a couple of key performance indicators <coughs> is critical, excuse me. Then the other thing that I want you to do, and this can be very simple, you, have, you all have spreadsheets, you all have Google, you have the name, you have the stage that they're in. So the stage that they're in reflects the, the different 
cases of the pipeline. Like, are they in the engagement phase? Are they in solicitation, et cetera? You write down the target amount. You write down when, we, when was the initial reach out? You write down the next step, when, it's, when you're doing the next step, who's doing it and what the notes are. And you literally look at this daily to move people along the pipeline. This is called moves management. But what this does is it provides some kind of tracking mechanism so that you're making sure that you're continuing to move people forward. And if someone is sitting on your list for too long and there's been no movement, you either decide we're gonna focus on them or we're gonna drop them down to our B list and we're gonna move someone else up to our A list. And I want you to always be looking at your top 20 and, and seeing movement there. Okay, I just dumped a lot of information on you. Uh, a couple of cool things, connect with me on LinkedIn because you know LinkedIn is my favorite. I have a podcast up called Nonprofit Lowdown. I have a free newsletter at realwong.com, which you should get on. I also have a book called Get That Money, Honey for $15. If you can't make up at least $15 to cover the cost of the book, then I don't even know what. All right, I'm going to stop my share questions. I just downloaded a lot of information. I usually have a lot more interaction, but I realize I have one hour and a lot of information to download, but I have six minutes. So questions. I, um, yes, I, Heather, please. Yes, yes, yes. So if you have a group of people for a newsletter, for instance, and you send them an update and it's got a video. It's like there are some platforms that you can't embed a video, so it's got to click away. So yeah. What, uh, how do you get them to stay engaged with reading? Do you put the video at the end? I mean, because that's the flash that people, oh, I love a video, you know, and it's a talking point. You keep the video 30 seconds or less, or, you know, um, but the platform like Constant Contact, for instance, they don't have that yet. So it will steer them away to YouTube or Vimeo or whatever. Right. What is what is the takeaway on how to keep them like, oh, I saw the video now. I want to go back and read the rest, or now I want to go engage on the rest of the ask or the click the button that says donate here or what have you. Okay. Chances are they're not going to look at your video and, and donate. <laughs> so I think you. Want, I think it's the wrong question. So the question is like, not, the question shouldn't be how do I keep a video from uh, linking them away? The question is, how do I make my content so compelling that they can't help but keep reading, right? Then the question too is like, what's the call to action? So if you have a video, what do you want them to do? And, and the what do you want them to do shouldn't necessarily be, I want them to donate. Right. Maybe they, they go to the website. In your case, with such a big list, have you ever surveyed your list? No. Okay, so this is actually a great opportunity for you to survey your list. Okay. Ask them questions. What do you like about being on this, on our newsletter list? What information is most valuable to you? Would you be interested in being a donor? Would you be interested in having a conversation about being a donor? Would you be interested in, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about your life circumstance and what brought you to AHA Broadway, right? So, the more you know your donor, the better able you are to target them, but also literally ask them like, who on this list is willing to be engaged as donors? Because some people don't, but some people will. And those are gonna be your obvious first, first target. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, thank you. Like, think about this. I can't buy something online without getting a review survey in my face, right? Yes. I buy something on Gap, they send me like five surveys. Like, how was this experience? So I think that we fear bothering people, but yet in every other sphere of our existence, people are not shy about asking for our opinions. So do not be shy about asking your donors. I mean, they, they are already on your list. Or, I mean, in your case, 44% is a pretty high target rate. Like, can you, can you look at your top, I don't know, top 100 people who are the most uh, active on your email list and just do a reach out and be like, hey, we're just doing, we're doing a focus group. We're, you know, would you be interested in answering some questions, right? Because here's the other thing, you really need to understand the mindset of your donor. The better able that you are able, 
to get into their head and understand like what, what is it they hope and dream? What is it they care about? What is it that's compelling about your organization? The better able you can craft your marketing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I have two minutes. So in the two minutes, first of all, let me just say thank you because you did give a lot of information, very resourceful. You make me walk away with like, okay, I got to rethink this whole thing and, you know, tweak it. You're you welcome. Know. So thank you. Uh, you mentioned LinkedIn. Yes. And I use LinkedIn for, you know, not for the nonprofit. And so my question to you is for someone who is on LinkedIn, I know I don't make posts weekly, more maybe bi-weekly, some months depending, maybe monthly. But for someone who also already has a presence on LinkedIn, but now kind of want to introduce, oh, by the way, I have an, a, a nonprofit if it's in its infancy stages. Do you have any advice regarding that? So, so what I hear you saying is like, how do you, how do you pivot your brand, right? Because mm -hmm. your LinkedIn stuff is all about your business, but you also have a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. How many followers do you have on LinkedIn? All the time I had, maybe, I think it's about 550, something like that. Okay. So what I might do in that case is um, on my personal page, you know, get really personal about like, hey, you all know me as doing this, but like, actually, I also have a nonprofit. Here's why it's important to me. Maybe tag a couple people who you think might be interested in hearing more about it, but sort of see what that looks like. Um, and then what you can also do is within LinkedIn, you can do a search on like people who are interested in joining nonprofit boards in your network. Presumably, they're sort of community oriented. You can do a search and then reach out and be like, hey, you know, we're friends on LinkedIn, blah, blah, blah. Notice that you all, we're also interested in nonprofit boards or pro bono work. Like if you're interested, love to connect on that, right? Because you have to like fill out your profile and let people know um, like that you're interested in such a thing. So again, this is about like being respectful of your donor and having them know that you are here to fulfill a need that they have. Like, they they told you that they were interested in this so you're saying like cool here's an opportunity for you and like that is my big takeaway here is like when you're thinking about donors it's about marrying their needs and desires with the work that you do it's not about you it's not about what you need it's about how they can link in to further their own need does that make sense it does okay it does. thank you friends this has been so fun. Appreciate it. I have to jump to another phone call. Please get on my email newsletter list. You'll get all the information about what I'm doing. I send weekly thought pieces about fundraising, but thank you for doing all the work that you are doing. Thank you for yours. Take care. Bye, Dr. Harris.